Good morning. Welcome Good morning. to First Church. Good to see you. Ooh, catch my breath. Uh, let's stand and hear our call to worship this morning from Psalm 145, verses 10 through 13. All your works shall give thanks to you, O Lord, and all your saints shall bless you. They shall speak of the glory of your kingdom and tell of your power to make known to the children of men your mighty deeds and the glorious splendor of your kingdom. Your kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and your dominion endures throughout all generations. Our Heavenly Father, we praise you for your dominion over the heavens and the earth. You created the stars and the uh, comets and the galaxies <coughs> above us. You also formed the sun and the moon and the planets around us. We thank you for this earth that you've given to us. We thank you as well, O oh Lord, for the heavenly beings, the angels above, and for the cherubim that stand before you. And we thank you for the redeemed of the Lord who are in your presence even now from uh, the, the years of uh, human existence here. We pray for your blessing on us as we gather here in this little community. We pray, Lord, that you would look upon us in your mercy and love we pray that you would bestow your blessing on us and grant us the help of your spirit as we draw near to you. We pray that Jesus would be lifted up and his glory proclaimed. And we ask it in his great and glorious name. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Please remain standing for our first hymn and it's a great hymn. Well, now singing can it be that I should gain 455, 455. Thank you. 
Let us remain standing and confess our faith as found in the Apostles' Creed. <clears throat> Church of the Lord Jesus, what do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What promise does Scripture give to those who confess the name of Jesus? If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. Thanks be to God. Amen and Amen. Scripture readings is found in Psalm 66, verses 1 through 7 this morning. Psalm 66, verses 1 through 7. Shout for joy to God, all the earth. Sing the glory of his name. Give to him glorious praise say to god how awesome are your deeds so great is your power that your enemies come cringing to you all the earth worships you and sings praises to you they sing praises to your name come and see what god has done he is awesome in his deeds toward the children of man he turned the sea into dry land they passed through the river on foot. There did, there did we rejoice in him, who rules by his might forever, whose eyes keep watch on the nations. Let not the rebellious exalt themselves. Next we're reading Matthew 8, verses 28 to 34. Matthew 8, 28 to 34. And when he came to the other side, to the country of the Gadarenes, two demon-possessed men met him, coming out of the tombs so fierce that no one could pass that way. And behold, they cried out, What have you to do with us, O Son of God? Have you come here to torment us before the time? Now a herd of many pigs was feeding at some distance from them. And the demons begged him, saying, If you cast us out, send us away into the herd of pigs. And he said to them, Go. So they came out and went into the pigs, and behold, the whole herd rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the waters. The herdsmen fled, and going into the city, they told everything, especially what had happened to the demon-possessed men. Behold, all the city came out to meet Jesus. When they saw him, they begged him to leave their region. Finally, we're reading 
in Colossians 1, 3 to 14. Colossians 1, 3 to 14. We always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, since, since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and the love that you have for all the saints, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. Of this you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and increasing, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth, just as you learned it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant. He is faithful, a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. And so, from the day we heard, we have not ceased to pray for you, asking that you may be filled with the knowledge of His will and all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as to walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to Him, bearing fruit in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God, being strengthened with all power according to His glorious might, for all endurance and patience with joy, giving thanks to the Father who has qualified you to share in the inheritance of the saints in light. He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us to the kingdom of his beloved Son, in whom we have redemption, the forgiveness of sins. Let's now go before the Lord and confess our sins. And I'm reading a prayer from the minister's prayer book of, uh, for confession of sin this morning. Shall we pray? Lord of heaven and earth, we confess that we have sinned against you. Have mercy upon us, O Lord, according to your great kindness, according to the multitude of your mercies, do away with our offenses for the sake of Jesus Christ. Wash from us our sins and make us clean in your sight. We ask in his name. Amen. Now hear these words of assurance of pardon or promise of forgiveness from 1 John 1, 8 and 9. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. This morning we come to the ninth chapter of the Westminster Confession of Faith, section 3. I've given our section the title, The Bondage of the Will, which if you are attuned to church history and um, particularly Martin Luther, you recall that he wrote a book by that name, The Bondage of the Will, and uh, an outstanding exposition of the uh, corruption of our human nature. Let me read for you this uh, section for you, and I'll make some comments on it. Man, by his fall into a state of sin, hath wholly lost all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So as a natural man, being altogether averse from that good, and dead in sin, is not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. We are talking about 
the nature of the human will. And last time we noted that God created Adam and Eve, our first parents, with a free will. They were not coerced, they were not forced to make a decision one way or the other. They functioned uh, based on their own inner desires and wishes in different things. Um, they were in a period of probation, a time of testing to see whether they would be faithful to God's command. And of course, we know that um, though they had the power to do that which is good, nonetheless, um, they were also uh, capable of sinning against God, and that is what they did when they ate of the forbidden fruit. And so now we come and note that by his fall into a state of sin, man has lost entirely or wholly uh, all ability of will to any spiritual good accompanying salvation. So the condition of our hearts, the condition of humanity has changed since the sin of Adam and Eve. From that point on, all humanity by natural generation has inherited a sinful nature, a nature which is hostile to God, a nature that is, in the words of the Apostle Paul, dead in trespasses and sins, entirely incapable of responding to God or serving God or doing anything good. So this is the, the state of sin into which we enter this life. As David said in the 51st Psalm, in sin my mother conceived me. From the very earliest moments of life, David was qualified by a sinful nature and his experience is ours as well. Parents, as you raise little children, you quickly see their, uh, their sinful nature revealing itself. And so, uh, we've lost all ability of will to any spiritual good. Uh, before I consider that, I'll, I'll make the note that liberal Christianity, which uh, rejects the, the testimony of Scripture on so many things, it does the same here, really has no place for a fall into sin and the corruption of our natures. Um, that would assume uh, that Adam and Eve were real historical people, that their eating of that forbidden fruit uh, was in disobedience to God and affected our humanity ever since then. Uh, the liberal uh, Christian looks with optimism on our human nature and our ability to do good things in the world, to reform the various problems of the world, to uh, address uh, issues of drunkenness and poverty and drug addiction, uh, immorality of different kinds and sorts. And so there is an optimism with regard to their view of human nature. Um, the scriptures give a different testimony to uh, our fallen condition. Uh, we've been considering this just recently as of last Wednesday in Romans chapter 8 where we read the carnal man, excuse me, the carnal mind, that is the mind of the flesh, is enmity against God. For it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So then they are they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Paul's estimate of our human nature is that it is entirely, totally depraved. It is incapable of doing anything good that would earn or merit salvation from God. And so the bent of our nature, the direction of our nature is away from God towards sin, towards self-expression and there is a refusal to submit to God in any form or fashion. Uh, Jesus is of the same mind as the Apostle Paul, as you would expect. Jesus said that no man can come to me except the Father which hath sent me draw him. Look, this is absolute language. No one can come to me. You may preach the gospel to many different people, but their hearts are bent towards corruption and sin and they will not turn to Christ. They cannot 
turn to Christ. Their hearts are steadfastly opposed to that. Jesus himself says, no one can come to me. They're incapable of doing that. And he goes on to say in that same chapter, verse 65, it looks like, he said, Therefore I say unto you that no man can come unto me except it were given him of my Father. There needs to be a sovereign, gracious work of God in someone's heart to draw them to Christ. Apart from God entering the equation and changing the situation, that person will never be saved. And so it's not just the liberal Protestant that has a problem, but the Arminian as well that recognizes with the liberal Protestant that man is basically morally neutral and has the ability to accept the gospel on his own. Scripture is very clear. Man does not have that ability. Does that mean that they are uh, the, the subject of faith, that they are forced to do uh, something opposed to the will, that even if they want to be saved, they cannot be saved? Well, they don't want to be saved. They will not want to be saved. It's just not in their nature. I've used some of these illustrations in the past, but you take a bird that's flying in the, the sky, a blue jay, a cardinal, a sparrow, what have you, a crow, an eagle. You can't take that bird. It's free to do this, but you can't take that bird and put it in the lake and expect it to swim underwater. It's not going to be happy there. Its nature is to fly. It's not even really going to run on the ground much at all, hop a little bit here and there, but its nature is to fly. By the same token, you take a fish that's swimming in the water, loves to be in the water, you take that fish and bring it out to the, the, the shoreline and put it on the ground, what's it going to do? It's going to flop around and try to get back as best it can back into the water. Its nature is such that it wishes to live within the, the realm that it is most comfortable with. And man is in the same way. His nature is such that he loves his sin. It's his atmosphere. It's his way of life. It's what he does. He loves his sin. He loves being away from God. And he will not come to God any more than a bird will swim underwater or a fish will walk about along land. So, the confession says, as a natural man being altogether averse from that good and dead in sin, he's not able by his own strength to convert himself or to prepare himself thereunto. Uh, there, there's no, no even preparation on the part of the unbeliever for uh, salvation. Uh, on his own, he cannot uh, begin to repent of his sins. He cannot be convicted of his sins uh, in terms of an offense against God and a desire to seek reconciliation. That is foreign to him. He might feel bad about different things that he does. He might be conscious significantly of his guilt and the corruption of his nature, but that doesn't mean he's going to come to God in Christ and seek for forgiveness. No, he'll try to reform his life, he'll seek counseling, he'll do this or that, he'll seek some religious experience that will uh, try to resolve that, but th there's no hope for him unless he comes to God in Christ. So the will of man is bound by his nature. The nature of man is uh, sinful and corrupt through and through. He will operate freely within his nature. He does what he wants to do. He doesn't want to come to Christ. He doesn't want to serve God. He wants to live his own life as he sees fit. He will be held accountable for that, uh, and God will judge him for that, and so he retains his responsibility. He acts according to his nature. His nature is corrupt, and he will suffer the consequences accordingly. Well, we'll finish here in our meditation on the confession, and let's turn to the Lord in prayer and bring our request to Him at this time. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we do thank You for Your Word, and we thank You for uh, the truth that it, it 
brings to us. It illumines our hearts and minds and helps us to see our relationship with you and with each other. We thank you, O Lord, that your word uh, guides us in life, and we pray that you would help us evermore to uh, love your word, to meditate on it, to abide in Christ. We thank you for our church and thank you for the blessing of our fellowship together. We thank you for those who are not able to be with us this morning and pray for your blessing on each one of them. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you would watch over our elderly and preserve their health and strength, encourage their hearts to rest in you. May they know that you love them, that you have provided for them uh, an eternal inheritance, and the day of their salvation is near at hand. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on them and pray that you would help them to look to Jesus. We pray then for your blessing on Eve Thomas and pray that you would encourage her to know that you love her and we love her as well. We pray too for uh, Rhoda and for Emmanuel. We thank you for them and pray that your love and blessing would be on them. We pray, Lord, that you would encourage their hearts Teach them from your word. Help them to grow in Christ. We pray, Lord, that their faith would be strong. We pray for many that you would bring him to faith, that you would do a marvelous and powerful work, uh, helping him to see the Savior, Jesus Christ, as his own Savior, the one who loved him and laid down his life for his salvation. We pray for your blessing on him. We pray, too, for others, uh, other loved ones in our families who are outside of Christ and uh, do not serve Him. We pray, Lord, that Your mercies would be on them. We pray that You would bring them life and salvation. We thank You for Your Gospel, that it is powerful to save. We thank You, Father, that You draw people to Christ, that they might be saved. And so we commit these, our loved ones, to Your fatherly care and pray that You would have mercy on them and deliver them from darkness and sin and bring them to the light of truth, the light of the gospel. May they find peace with you, reconciliation, and a new heart, a new life. And we pray that you would be glorified in this, that Jesus would be exalted in what he is able to do in the hearts and lives of many. Father, we pray that you would uh, watch over Jesse and Margaret and their new home. We thank you for providing them a place to stay. And we pray for your provision and care for them. We pray that you would sustain Jesse, uh, bless the treatments he receives for his uh, leukemia. We pray, Lord, that if it be your will, you would be pleased to extend his days, bless him with good health, and give him great joy in his time with you and with Margaret and with loved ones as well. Father, we pray that you would uh, watch over Margaret's health and bring her healing and strength uh, from day to day. Father, we pray that you would bless uh, um, the Christian rep as he begins his ministry in um, Park Church as their uh, organizing pastor. We pray, Lord, for your blessing on him and his labors. We pray that your word would flourish through him. We thank you for his wife and uh, children and pray that you would protect and bless them as well. And Father, we pray for Greg O'Brien and the work in Downingtown. We thank you for this effort to uh, proclaim your name in that community. We pray, Lord, that as you have raised up four men to serve as elders within the congregation, we give you thanks for that, and we pray that you would bless them, that they would uh, grow together in faith and love and be a, a joy and a help to your uh, people there. We pray that you would provide for their financial needs and enable them, strengthen them to become uh, a fully uh, a particular church of the Orthodox Presbyterian Church. We ask for your blessing on uh, Greg and his family, that you would strengthen and encourage them and provide for their needs. We thank you for the many ways in which you watch over us. We pray, Lord, that you would bless uh, our congregation be with Esther. We pray, Lord, for your hand of healing on her. Uh, we thank you for her and for her ministry to your people. We pray, Lord, that you would sustain her in life. Uh, continue to watch over John and his health and continue to help him to uh, be strong and we ask for your blessings on him. Father, we uh, 
commit these things and, and many others to you in prayer and pray that you would teach us to pray even as our Lord taught his disciples to pray, saying, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. <clears throat> Our next hymn is 691, It Is Well With My Soul. 691.
Today we are in Mark chapter 5, and I'll read for you the first 20 verses of the chapter there. Mark chapter 5. They came to the other side of the sea, to the country of the Gerasenes. And when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. He lived among the tombs, and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart, and he broke the shackles in pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out, and cutting himself with stones. And when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. And crying out with a loud voice, he said, What have you to do with me, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. And Jesus asked him, What is your name? He replied, My name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. Now a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him, saying, Send us to the pigs. Let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs. And the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned in the sea. The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country. And people came to see what it what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had had the legion, sitting there, clothed and in his right mind. And they were afraid. And those who had seen it described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. And he did not permit him, but said to him, Go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. Let's pray. Father, we would ask for your blessing on the opening of your word this morning. We pray that the light of the truth of your word would shine brightly before us, that we would see the glory of Jesus, the Son of the Most High God, that we would be moved to bow before him and acknowledge him as Lord. And we pray that you would do your great and glorious work. We pray that you would save some here this day and through the ministry of your word and, uh, as it goes abroad. We ask that you would be glorified in Jesus' name. Amen. Last time we saw Jesus out in the stern of the boat while waves were splashing up over the, the sides of the boat, the winds were blowing, and it was a wild scene. Jesus, being exhausted, was sound asleep in the back of the boat, but the disciples, alarmed by what they were seeing, these experienced fishermen who were in their element, who knew how to handle boats and uh, were accustomed to storms, they were terrified. They felt they were going to be killed that night. 
And here's Jesus in the back of the boat sleeping. So they quick rouse him and ask him, don't you care that we're perishing? This is a life and death situation for them. And we saw Jesus stood up in the boat, put his hands out towards the winds and the waves and said, peace, be still. He rebuked the winds, the waves began to calm and the other boats that were in the vicinity similarly saw everything come to a very quick and calm resolution. This was no ordinary event. This was the power of Jesus, whom John's gospel intends to present as the Son of God. Only God, the God who created the heavens and the earth, who formed the seas and uh, brought about the dry land, only this God could tell the winds and the waves to be still, and they would obey him. So the story ends up with the disciples marveling at Jesus saying, who is this who commands both the winds and the waves? This was blowing their minds as much as they've seen so far of Jesus and the miracles that he's performed, even the uh, healing uh, of those who are demon possessed. This was well beyond what they've experienced or what they were able to comprehend. God puts us in situations where our understanding of Jesus needs to be deepened. Our uh, view of his person, his glory, uh, his, his wonder needs to be expanded in our hearts and minds. We too often have too small of a view of God and what he is able to do for us in Christ. We have too shriveled an appreciation for the salvation that we've received in Christ and the glories that are yet to come. We don't think much of all that is yet before us in terms of the progress of history and the coming of Christ at the end of history and the new heavens and the new earth. These things go far beyond what we are accustomed to thinking about. We turn on our news, we see the wars, we see the poverty, we see the, the stock market and its gyrations, we see all kinds of things and we wonder What's going on? <clears throat> Jesus said to his disciples, look up for your redemption draws nigh. Have a larger view of what God is doing in the world today. Now Jesus had left the shoreline because of the great crowds and they're pressing up against him. They recall he had to sit in a boat to just get some distance from them and to be able to teach them. And now being exhausted, he comes to the other side of the Sea of Galilee. One might think that the reason for this was to escape the crowds, get to an area where Jesus was relatively unknown, get to a place where it was sparsely populated so that Jesus and the disciples could have a time of rest. It's been nonstop, almost 24 seven for them, constant, uh, activity and pressures on them. And now finally, they're looking for an opportunity to relax. And so they cross the Sea of Galilee and there's some question as to where exactly it is that they land. Uh, the the uh, transmission of the Greek text, not just Mark, but Matthew and Luke as well, have some different names here as to the, the location where this uh, uh, event will occur. Uh, is it Gerasa? Is it Gergesene? Is it uh, the Gadarenes? Gadara? Um, what is the name of this place and where precisely is it located? And the, a couple of the names uh, are, are located in the south southeast section of the Sea of Galilee. And by the way, all of this is taking place in Gentile territory, not among the Jewish people. And so and the, the city, the, the ten cities, the Decapolis are largely uh, pagan cities. And the people who inhabit them are, are not uh, followers of Yahweh, not uh, observers of the Jewish religion or anything like that. Uh, so it's reasonable that Jesus and his disciples going there would expect that they would not be recognized, that people wouldn't know who they were, they wouldn't be crowding around Jesus looking for miracles and so forth. Um, it would be a time of rest. 
The one thing about, excuse me, I, I should finish the, the description of the location here. Um, some of the locations posited for it to the south are a little bit too far removed from the shoreline in terms of uh, the, the, the story that unfolds for us. We're given some uh, geography here, a picture of the landscape uh, by Mark. Um, there, there is a cliff nearby, of course, where the pigs will go down. And from the cliff goes right down into the sea. So you've got that rather major uh, location there. And then also you have a lot of tombs there where people would be buried. Well, there were caves in the area, which was a natural place for people to bury their dead. So does that fit uh, the landscape that you find in the southern part of the Sea of Galilee, the south-southeast? And when you look at it, it really doesn't. There's nothing in the way of a cliff there. There's nothing in the way of caves down there. So uh, although you've got some of the names down there that potentially show up in the, the Greek manuscripts, um, they're not likely in and of themselves. Now, one way of explaining it is to say, well, we're talking about the region there, the territory of the, of the Gerasenes or what have you, and that would include the coastline as it comes up there. But even so, the coastline, again, doesn't really match the story itself. There is one possible location uh, Roughly halfway on the east side of the Sea of Galilee, it's uh, called Gergesa, if I remember correctly. It's a city lo located just to the east and central to the Sea of Galilee. And uh, it's the, the city itself is just a little bit off the, the coastline there. Uh, but along the coast, you do have a cliff that leads down into the, the sea. And you have caves on the hillside uh, where the dead might be buried. So it's quite possible that this is the site where the uh, miracle took place, the, the confrontation with the demoniac. And so Jesus and his disciples uh, arrive at the shoreline. They uh, begin to step out and to pull the boat up to the sh shore onto the beach there. And Jesus steps out and as soon as he gets out you see Mark's uh, narrative skill here his habit his action orientation which I think reflects on Peter being really the the one who's behind Mark and telling the story it's his eyewitness account uh, you have Mark saying immediately this man comes running down from the caves up above from the tombs up above running towards Jesus well, what was that like? You're there with the disciples, you're coming off the boat, and all of a sudden this guy comes running towards you, and he must have looked like a wild man. I have to think that his hair is kind of all over the place, kind of like certain people here. Uh, uh, you know, beard all over the place, and uh, he's dirty, he's filthy, he's been cutting himself, so there's scars and there's blood on him, and he's yelling, and he's coming down the mountain. You wonder, what in the world are we dealing with here? A madman. But it seems that as he comes out of the tombs and starts running down towards the coast there, a change comes over him. And he realizes this is just no ordinary visitor that he's going to terrorize, but this is Jesus, the Son of the Most High God. The demonic presence within this man could see but we can't see immediately. We look on Jesus perhaps and see a, you know, a typical, typical Jewish man so high and certain sort of build, look to his eyes and so forth. We don't perceive that this is the Son of God. But within the demonic realm, they can see that front and center. This is no ordinary person that stepped on the shore. This is the son of the most high God. And so he runs up to Jesus and bows before him. Remember, Mark is going to tell us about this character that he inhabits the tombs. So there, there's something of a, a, a love for death about him, a, a celebration of death. He's cutting himself, so he's harming himself 
Uh, and the, the townspeople could not control him. There were efforts by the civil authorities, by uh, the townspeople to bind this man up, tie him up in chains, shackle him, and try to control him because he was attacking people. Maybe he was a murderer as well. But he was so powerful because of the demonic presence within him that he snapped those chains off. Um, you, you see here very clearly that there is a demonic power at work within him. And that is what elevates his strength as a human to do superhuman things. Um, we can look for different evidences of demonic presence in people like this sort of thing. Um, superhuman strength, just a, a love for that which is corrupt and evil. We look at our world today and we see the kinds of things going on, particularly in our Western world view, which is naturalistic, science-based. We have our technology, our skills. We've, we manip manipulate nature to do what we want to do. And stories of demon possession, stories of healings and these kinds of things, which come out of the biblical period of time, are things which to the modern worldview are um, highly questioned, to say the least. Uh, considered more mythological, superstitious, not grounded in reality. Reality is chemicals and reality is atoms and reactions and these kinds of things. And so our modern world is not used to listening to this kind of a story and recognizing it as credible and as true. Now, Mark is presenting it as real history. There are multiple people witnessing to the, the account. When Mark writes his account uh, and it gets published, perhaps the townspeople in the Decapolis, all these people in the, to the east, would know about this man who was healed and indeed, there were townspeople who would come and see what took place and so they could witness to the fact that this guy was out of control. We could not do anything with him. And then Jesus comes and meets him and suddenly the man has changed. He's dressed, he's clothed and in his right mind. What happened here? This took place in real history. There were witnesses who could testify to this event. And science does not take into account everything. Science doesn't take into account the human soul, our feelings, emotions, um, all these kinds of things. Uh, what is love? Is that a chemical reaction? Is joy simply a chemical reaction? There's more to it. There's a spiritual side of life, and we need to uh, receive this testimony as uh, more than credible, as true. So the, the man uh, bows before Jesus and, and says, I know who you are. You're Jesus, son of the most high God. And this was a way in which uh, the, the view of some is that uh, those who were engaged in exorcism would want to know the name of the demon. And by having that name, they could have a certain power over that demon and cast the demon out. And so when the, the, the demon says, I know who you are, you're Jesus, the son of the most high God, um, it's almost as though as he's trying to flip the script and uh, get control over Jesus in this way. Um, but Jesus uh, commands the unclean spirit to come out of him. The unclean spirit is terrified by this. Uh, he's frightened by the fact that Jesus may want to cast him into the abyss, which is to prematurely send these demons into hell itself and confine them there so that they cannot continue to wreak havoc within the, the community the way they have been, perhaps for centuries. And so that's their great terror, and they, uh, in our English standard 
translation, which I think is not perhaps the most uh, readable. Uh, I adjure you by God most high, uh, do not torment me before the time, do not cast me into the abyss. Uh, it, it, it's a, a request to have Jesus swear that he will not destroy them. Now, you'll note in the text that Jesus does not respond to that request. He does not grant the request. He's commanding the, the uh, demon and, as it turns out, demons, uh, to come out of the man. And so Jesus asks them, the man, first of all, what is your name? And the man says, my name is Legion, for we are many. Here is a man who is not simply possessed of a demon, but possessed by a multitude of demons. I'm reminded of the, um, the arguments back in the Middle Ages or, and, and beyond of how many angels can fit on the head of a pin. And well, since they don't occupy space, you could have all kinds of angels sitting on the head of a pen. Similarly, in the demonic realm, uh, you could have multiple demons occupying a person. Here you got thousands, thousands of demons. A legion is actually 6,000 soldiers in the Roman army. They don't specify that there are 6,000, but apparently there were perhaps 2,000 as 2,000 of the pigs uh, went over the cliff. So the name is Legion, and by saying that, we are brought into a great conflict here between Jesus and the realm of evil. And just as Jesus had the power over the winds and the waves and caused them to be still, Jesus had the power over the demonic realm. In its great force, with thousands of demons arrayed against him, and they are terrified of him, And they plead with him not to torment them before the time. I, I should note that we read earlier from the Gospel of Matthew, and Matthew's Gospel said there were two men, two demon-possessed men, and Mark just says one man. Luke also has a, a, a similar account to Mark, and he says there's just one man, or at least he says there's one man. Neither Mark nor Luke deny that there were two men, they simply assert that there's one man. And certainly, if you have two men, you necessarily have one man. And so it's not wrong to say that one man came to them. Now, why the difference between the two accounts? Well, interestingly, in Matthew's account, you don't have uh, so much the, the conversion of the man and him uh, seeking to follow after Jesus or to go off then and proclaim the name of Jesus to his community. Uh, in, in Matthew's account, there's a focus on the fact that Jesus is the messianic king. He is the one of great power. And so all the focus is on the fact that he drives out the demon. And that's the end of it. That's the focus. But here... In Mark and Luke, the emphasis, I think, is on the salvation of the particular man, which suggests that one man is saved and one is left. He might have had the demons cast out of him, but it's like Jesus told the other story. You know, if you cast out one with seven, uh, cast out a demon out of someone, if there's no repentance, no turning to God, then seven more demons will come back to that person. So, it may be that the attention is on this one person rather than both of them in Mark and Luke because this one was the object of God's saving work. Quite often you find in the scriptures that God's attention is on his people. They are what's important to him. He names his people, but the unbeliever, the wicked, the pagans, they just kind of go by without much observation. God's focus is on his elect. And here, not only perhaps was the reason for arriving at this shoreline to get a place of rest, but also Jesus came to save this man and to show forth his glory as the Son of God. 
And so uh, Jesus allows the, the demons to come out of the a man and go into the herd of pigs up on the hillside. And something strange happens at this point. These demons come into these pigs, which is kind of a, a weird thing to think about. The animal world is subject to demonic presence. Uh, that's kind of weird. Uh, but they, they come into these pigs up on the hillside and then all of a sudden the pigs go running over the cliff down into the water and they drown in the sea. What's going on there? I'm kind of surprised and, and amazed at commentators who, who are very much concerned about the condition of the pigs and what happens to the pigs. 2,000 pigs die. Does Christ have no compassion for the, these animals? Well, yeah, but he has a greater purpose in mind. To me, this is symbolic of the fact that he is casting these demons into the abyss. How else, I think, can you read that? The pigs going off over the edge, into the water, into the abyss to be destroyed. It's symbolic of the fact that Jesus was, in fact, going to cast these demons into the abyss, into hell itself, so that they could not torment the world any longer. The Apostle John writes in 1 John 3, Verse 8, that the Son of Man came to uh, destroy the works of the devil. That's why Christ came into the world, to destroy the works of the devil. And in Colossians chapter 2, Paul talks about how at the cross, Jesus disarmed the rulers and authorities. The Father, excuse me, disarmed the rulers and the powers, uh, the demonic realm. It's at that moment that the demonic realm is restrained dramatically. And I would suggest that with the advance of the kingdom of God throughout uh, the world, the forces of the demonic world have been driven back. And you don't see the kinds of things that Jesus and the disciples were experiencing there. Uh, which reminds me, it, it, it's kind of a, dangerous and exciting thing to be following Jesus because all things, all kinds of things happen around him. And, and you have this attack of the demons coming, uh, the, the apparent attack of the demons and the man coming towards Jesus, but that gets resolved. But as we follow Christ, we can be exposed to all kinds of dangers. Jesus said, if they hate me, they will hate you. If they persecute me, they will persecute you. I read a story this week of a, a Christian a former uh, army medic who uh, was doing some street preaching in Arizona. He was on a busy corner preaching and inviting people to come to church services at the Victory Christian Chapel or something like that where he belonged. So he was out street preaching and apparently this wasn't the first time he was there. He was there on multiple occasions and eyewitnesses of this said that people would be yelling at him, screaming at him, cursing at him. I don't know, maybe even spitting at him and that sort of thing. Well, this week, on Wednesday, somebody shot him in the head. Put him in critical condition in the hospital. Last I heard, he was still in the hospital. Could very well die from that, obviously. It can be a dangerous thing following after the Lord Jesus and confronting the wicked of this world. There is an almost demonic activity in the world today that is mind-boggling when you think about it. I don't have time to get into that, but um, Jesus has come to destroy the works of the devil. And most especially, Hebrews uh, tells us, uh, I believe in the second chapter, at the end of the, the chapter, about verse 14, that Jesus took on our human flesh so that he might destroy death and the one who has the power of it. So here is a man who loved death, indeed was threatening himself with cutting himself the way he did, a man who uh, made life miserable for others, who they could not control. Jesus comes, rescues him from the demonic host that was within him, casts these demons into the abyss, 
and the man is delivered. Some say when Jesus asked him what is his name, he was trying to get the man, the personality of the man to come through and to reveal itself and to distinguish the man from the demons. And it was the demons that answered, so the man was just thoroughly subsumed under this demonic presence. But now he's set free. And Mark records he was dressed and in his right mind. What an amazing thing God does for us in his work of grace and salvation. He cleans us up, straightens us out, enables us to think more accurately about the world around us and to serve him. Something great and dramatic occurred in this person. One moment given to death, darkness and evil. The next moment, cleaned up, clothed in his right mind, and he desires to be with Jesus. Why wouldn't he? He wanted to come along, follow Jesus, learn more of him. But Jesus does not uh, grant him his request. He says, go back to your home, go back to your cities, tell your friends and your family all the things that God has done for you and how God had mercy on you. And he does that. When Christ delivers us in a marvelous way from our sin, he calls us then to go out and to tell others. And it can be a very simple thing. Jesus saved me. He gave me a new life. That's all you gotta say, really. Then come to church, come to First Presbyterian, wherever, where you can learn about Jesus, but Jesus saves. It's the great message of the gospel. It can be very simple. The man did not have theological training. He did not walk with Jesus and listen to his teaching and then could quote it. He didn't have any background in the Old Testament scriptures probably as a Gentile. But just go and tell people what God has done for you, what Jesus has done for you, and that's what he did. This is a wonderful story, but the goal is not so much to talk about a wild man and his deliverance, but to point our attention to Jesus and who he is, the Son of the Most High God, who has power over the demonic world, power over the natural world, who has compassion on those who are enslaved and sets them free. And as Paul says in Colossians 1, we too once dwelt in the realm of darkness, in the dominion of darkness, but we've been set free and brought into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of God's dear Son. And so we are saved. Let's pray. Lord, we pray that your blessing will be on your word. We pray that you would help us to see your glory and all that you have done uh, in your compassion to save even uh, someone who is utterly wicked, who is dominated by thousands of demons, yet you were willing to take this one to cast out his demons, to set him free, to wash him, to cleanse him, to reconcile him with God, to give him a mission in life. And someday we will walk the streets of gold with that man, praising you for all that you've done. What an amazing savior you are. We thank you for your love for uh, the weakest and the poorest, those who are enslaved by sin, and that you set us free. We ask for your blessing on us that you would encourage us to love and serve you. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. By this time we'll bring before the Lord our morning tithes and offerings.
thank you, Father, for your many gifts, and pray that as we bring our offerings to you, that you would bless them and multiply them to the glory of our Savior and to the advance of his work in this place and around the world. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Please remain standing, and Rick will lead us in our final hand. Our final hymn is 693, Blessed Assurance. 693. be the Lord, the God of Israel, who alone does wondrous things. Blessed be his glorious name forever. May the whole earth be filled with his glory. Amen and amen. Amen.